Okay. Uh, Kalispera se olus. Uh, good evening. I will. Uh, I think I will switch to English uh, to accommodate any English speaking attendees. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to have Dr. Costas Kumenis tonight with us. Uh, and um, uh, beyond the immense honor that he's doing us, I would like to thank him again uh, for being a part of this uh, talk series. And uh, I would like to start with a brief introduction uh, before I give him the floor. So uh, Dr. Kumenis was born in Nicosia, Cyprus. Uh, uh, Cyprus. He received his uh, bachelor degree in pharmacy with honors from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and his PhD degree in biochemistry from the University of Houston, Texas in 1994. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship in radiation and tumor biology at Stanford University. And then he was appointed as an assistant professor at Wake Forest University in 1999, and then moved to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia as associate professor. He is currently the Richard Chamberlain endorsed professor and vice chair for research in the Department of Radiation Oncology at UPenn Perlman School of Medicine. His scientific research interests include the study of the role of the tumor microenvironment on tumor progression, metastasis, and resistance to therapy. His group is also engaged in the development of novel radiation toxicity mouse models and the testing of new radiation technologies and modalities such as flash radiotherapy. Uh, Dr. Kumanis, uh, again, thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. Um... Apologies for uh, giving my presentation in English, but uh, uh, I would have liked to be, first of all, in person in Cyprus, but the timing was not very good. Um, I've been away from Cyprus for 32 years, so my giving the talk in, in, in Greek would be rather difficult. And also, I, I like to be able to accommodate any English speaking um, people who may be listening to us. Um, thank you to Maria and to the Cyprus Biological Society for inviting me to present my uh, group's research. It, it's indeed uh, a, a pleasure and an honor to present in this forum. Let me uh, uh, share my screen now. Um, okay, let's see how this goes. Okay, get the pointer ready. Okay, um, so uh, Maria gave a, a an introduction to my scientific career, but I, I hope you can um, indulge me in, in uh, presenting my almost self uh, autobiographical journey um, uh, because it's important for this forum and I haven't given a, a presentation in Cyprus for several years now. So my, my scientific journey began very early on. Probably those of you in Cyprus and especially in Nicosia will recognize this. This is the elementary sc school of Ayos Andreas in Ayos Andreas Nicosia where I got my primary education, and then I moved to um, uh, what was then the uh, Boys uh, Gikos uh, Gymnasium at the time, and now it's the um, uh, first Lyceum of Gikos. And I, I would say that, you know, reminiscing back to these days, I, I think the solid foundation of my education, um, especially and also immersing myself into the English language, got its footing in these two uh, institutions and uh, also intrigued me in the scientific um, in a scientific career. Um, then, as Maria mentioned, I went to the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki to study pharmacy, but then I had the, uh, the pleasure and the luck of uh, attending lectures by this very uh, distinguished uh, uh, gentleman, Dimitrios Kiriakidis, who was uh, at the time associate professor of biochemistry. And although I, I planned to become a, a pharmacist and return to Cyprus, he really uh, intrigued, uh, intrigued me uh, the way he, he was teaching and what I was learning about biochemistry. That by the end uh, of my studies, I decided to pursue advanced uh, studies in the States. And I, I went to one of the biggest uh, cities in the United States, uh, Houston, Texas, you see here, to attend University of Houston. And I didn't know much about research. Uh, I, I found a lab that I, I thought the uh, the uh, subject intrigued me and I studied actually neurobiology and what you see here is a simulask. This is called Aplesia californica. It's an invertebrate. And I was studying uh, for my PhD, uh, how circadian rhythms work and, and the, the protein machinery behind circadian rhythms. But by the end of, of my studies, I, I really didn't want to continue neurobiology. I, I wanted a more applied 
or translational type of research. And um, I was very lucky to be accepted uh, for a fellowship at Stanford, a postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, and this was were probably uh, the best scientific uh, years um, that I have spent. Uh, as a postdoc, especially in the States, you're free to um, develop your own ideas. The scientific environment at Stanford was excellent. And I entered into the world of the tumor microenvironment and radiation biology. And um, it also uh, allowed me to indulge in giving some tips. I know some of the uh, people in the audience may be students or uh, postdoctoral fellows. So one of the first tips or advice I will give you is don't be afraid to, to change, uh, to change uh, projects or even fields. Uh, as you'll see, uh, I never regretted uh, uh, going into the field of, of cancer biology because that's where uh, my interest lies. I was also very lucky uh, at the time to uh, work for a, a then relatively a new um, uh, assistant professor, uh, Dr. Amado Giaccia, who really has been uh, highly supportive in my career um, through the years. Uh, we're actually really good friends now. We organize meetings together and I owe him a lot. And another tip number two is um, seek good mentors, mentors that will uh, support you and promote your career. And I was very lucky uh, to have Amado uh, as my mentor during my postdoctoral studies. And as you heard, I, I then moved to Wake Forest University, a relatively smaller university in North Carolina, where I, I established my lab. But being in a smaller place actually gave me the freedom uh, from pressure that you, you, you find in these big, huge places like Penn, like Harvard and Yale, uh, and developed my lab. Uh, I spent seven years there, developed my own research hypothesis. And then when I became relatively successful, I was recruited to a much bigger place, uh, University of Pennsylvania, which you can see here, uh, it's, this is just the medical school of, of UPenn. It's almost a city by itself. Uh, it's, it's a very big, big place where I am right now. And um, probably I will move again in the future. I don't think I'm gonna end my career here, so who knows? So be open to change, be open to challenges. That's my uh, take home message from this. Uh, some disclosures before I start, I'm, I'm the scientific founder of a, of a company called Beltion Therapeutics that I'm gonna mention later on, a consultant for another pharmaceutical company. These relate to the project I will talk to you about today. And today I will talk to you about one of the major projects in my lab, which as Maria mentioned in the beginning is the understanding of the stresses in the tumor microenvironment and how uh, tumor cells are able to adapt and evade uh, these stresses. So what you see here is um, you probably, those working in the cancer field have come across this. These are what are called hallmarks of cancer. These basically are obstacles or, or hoops that cells have to go through to become fully tumorigenic and form a growing and metastatic tumor. And these have been updated through the years. This is from a, a, a revised version published in Cell in 2010. And as you can see here, uh, tumor hypoxia or low oxygen regions that usually go hand in hand with um, uh, nutrient stress are one of the hallmarks of cancer. Uh, tumors have to adapt to this stress because most solid tumors, if not the vast majority, can be hypoxic. You can see that hypoxia impinges on uh, um, very important processes such, such as angiogenesis, proteotoxic stress, metabolic stress, and so on. And since 2010, we know that it actually impinges on a, a variety of additional uh, stresses. And, and stress support systems are targets for tumor selective therapy because these stresses normally do not exist outside the confines uh, of a developing tumor. So when I started my lab at Wake Forest, uh, first of all, uh, you know, uh, like everywhere in the world, you have to differentiate yourself from what you're doing during your postdoc. You have to become independent. And I was looking for a project and I started reading. I read a lot <clears throat> during those days. And I came across this very interesting paper because I was very interested in protein synthesis, the machinery of protein synthesis, how it's regulated by these stresses. Um, and I came across this interesting paper that uh, talked about suppression of protein synthesis in brain during hibernation. And interestingly, this paper dealt with squirrels. Okay, so what do squirrels have to do with cancer? Well, this figure intrigued me a lot that uh, this shows the uh, ongoing protein synthesis in, in, in an uh, active uh, squirrel. And this shows the protein synthesis going on when the squirrels hibernate and, and they stop moving during the winter time. And this is remarkable. This really attracted my attention. Most protein synthesis, 99% of it shuts down during hibernation. How is this possible? We know protein synthesis is very important for multiple processes in the cell. But this makes sense because during hibernation, the squirrels have to conserve all the energy they don't need at all, and probably other animals as well. So this group uh, also um, you know, sacrificed some squirrels that were active or during hibernation, 
And they were able to identify this really remarkable change in the phosphorylation of this very important translation initiation factor called the F2 alpha. You can see that in the, in, during hibernation, it's highly phosphorylated. And basically, uh, most global protein synthesis shuts down except the very, very basic functions, which for most cells is the uh, maintenance of, um, uh, of ion uh, channels and ion um, the gradients in the cell. So then we decided, uh, this was one of the first experiments I did in my lab. Uh, I decided to look whether that was happening in, in tumor cells and in cancers. And indeed, when we took um, adenocarcinoma cells and exposed them in vitro to hypoxia using a, spe a specialized chamber, Indeed, we saw that the phosphorylation of the F2 alpha increases, and this actually correlates very nicely with a reduction in methionine incorporation as you measure protein synthesis. In the same paper, we also showed that if you use a dominant negative allele of this phosphorylation side of, of uh, EF2 alpha, uh, which acts in a dominant negative way, uh, you can actually um, block the phosphorylation, and this also um, <clears throat> correlates with an attenuation of the inhibition of protein synthesis. So we established that, um, uh, that hypoxia somehow phosphorylates EF2 alpha, and this actually we showed in the same paper, protects the cells from, from death, okay? Because likely, as we showed later, um, they uh, consume less, less energy. But what was the kinase that was responsible for this? Uh, we identified this upstream kinase called PERC. It's an endoplasmic reticulum kinase. I'm gonna show you in the next slide. Uh, and again, we showed that, um, um, if we express a dominant negative allele of PERC that cannot, uh, lacks the catalytic domain, you will block phosphorylation of the F2 alpha, and we achieve a very similar attenuation in protein synthesis as we do with the EF2 alpha. This, is, this was rather, these were rather pr primitive tools that we have at the time, but I'm going back now 20, uh, 20 years. So fast forward uh, uh, 20 years to today, and this is where we stand now as a group uh, we have established primarily that uh, this whole um, uh, pathway called the integrated stress response is not only active in tumors, but it actually uh, uh, helps tumors survive the stress. And we've published through the years a number of papers showing that uh, this kinase PERC indeed is highly active in tumors. It phosphorylates EF2 alpha. Uh, and downstream of EF2 alpha is a very important translation initiation factor called ATF4, which very interestingly, uh, I told you that phosphorylation of EF2 alpha stops global protein synthesis. But paradoxically, this creates conditions that allow not only for the uh, continuing translation, but enhanced translation of factors such as ATF4. This is reminiscent of other stress responses in mammalian cells, such as the heat shock response, autophagy, and so on. Um, and, and later on, um, both we and others have shown that two additional arms of this uh, stress response uh, that emanate from the plasma reticulum and mediated by the other uh, kinase IRE1, and also a, a transcription factor that is proteolytically cleaved upon stress and, and uh, forms the, the C domain of ATF6, um, uh, XPQ1, which is downstream of IRE1, and, and the cytoplasmic domain of ATF6, go into the nucleus where together with ATF4, uh, they can dimerize and, and uh, upregulate the expression of a large number of genes, over 100 genes, that are involved in these adaptive processes. Now this process developed, this integrated stress response developed um, not, to pro not to cause cancer, but to protect from uh, things such as hypoxia, nutrient deprivation that also exist in tumors. Uh, and as you can see, some of these genes are involved in increasing the folding capacity of the ER uh, because that was the uh, uh, evolutionary reason for the development of this process. But it also uh, are upregulating processes such as angiogenesis, metastasis, and senescence that tumors co-opt to, to, um, uh, to grow and, and spread uh, in organisms. Now, why is it called the integrated stress response? Because in addition to PERC, we uh, uh, identified another kinase that sits in the cytoplasm called GCN2 that responds not to unfolded proteins as, as PERC does, but responds to amino acid deprivation. When you have uncharged CRNAs, you activate GCN2 to phosphorylate the F12. And again, this makes sense because First of all, if you have misfolded proteins or you don't have amino acids to charge the tRNAs, that means you should stop making new proteins. And that's why you phosphorylate the F12. But as I mentioned, this creates the conditions for upregulation of ATF4, but uh, as you will see later, it becomes really important in, um, um, in how tumors uh, can progress and metastasize. And, be, and therefore, this process is called the integrated stress response. 
And components of the integrated stress response or the unfolded protein response, as you see, IRE1, <clears throat> are now um, the uh, subjects of intense scrutiny for, for drug development. Uh, first of all, they're kinases and they're easy to target. Uh, and second, because we've shown, we and others have shown through the years that are really critical for tumor progression. And um, just this September, a, a startup company uh, in New York City raised a lot of capital and started studies uh, partially based on our work, but also that of, other, of others to inhibit uh, PERC. They developed this uh, very potent and specific uh, PERC inhibitor that received fast track designation from the FDA. So this pathway is now in the clinic uh, as a drug target. So I'm gonna spend uh, the rest of my talk giving you um, two stories uh, that one is, has been published uh, and refers to how intrinsic stress, not in the form of hypoxia, but in the form of oncogenic transformation uh, and upregulation activates these, these two pathways. Uh, and in the second part of my talk, I will tell you how cell extrinsic, um, uh, we'll talk to you about the cell extrinsic role of the integrated stress response that is uh, currently in revision. So, uh, <clears throat> oncogenes uh, are important for progression through, uh, um, uh, through transformation, as you saw earlier, it's one of the hallmarks, the, there has to be mutations or amplifications in these uh, uh, genes, and one of the prototypical ones is the proto-oncogen MYC. So MYC regularly regulates uh, cell growth and, pro and proliferation, but it's highly deregulated in a number of, of tumors. It's uh, thought now that over 70% of human tumors including lymphoma, melanoma, and so on, uh, upregulate MYC. And um, although MYC induces proliferation and, and um, uh, growth, like most oncogenes do, it does something really, really well, better than any other oncogene. And that is, it dramatically upregulates translation of proteins. It, it actually uh, sets the cell up to synthesize much more protein. <clears throat> and it does that primarily by upregulating ribosome biogenesis and also specific uh, translation factors. And there's a specific uh, disease uh, called Burkitt's lymphoma in which uh, CMYK is translocated uh, from chromosome eight to other chromosomes containing immunoglobulin promoters. And this actually, when MYK sits right next to these promoters, it, it, uh, it's upregulated dramatically at the mRNA and protein level and drives forward uh, uh, progression. And um, there, is, there is actually uh, one of the first uh, transgenic mice uh, or, or genetic uh, models of cancer it was the immunomic mouse, which was characterized back in 1985, that spontaneously has this translocation, and these mice get lymphoma. I'll refer to these mice mouse models later on. So uh, here's my, my third tip of the day. Um, if you want to be successful, hire really good uh, and motivated students. And I was very lucky. One of my first graduate students was Lori Hart Soffer. She was a, a, a student uh, of mine at Wake Forest, and actually rejoined my group later on as a postdoctoral fellow uh, while I was at Penn. And the work I'm describing here was done while she was a postdoc. And <clears throat> um, Lori's work characterized how CIMIC actually increases its protein synthesis, causes an imbalance of chaperones to uh, client proteins in the ER, activates the unfolded protein response, phosphorylates PERC that activates EF12. And this activation, uh, as I mentioned earlier, through the inhibition of global synthesis, blocks simic induced apoptosis, but also through potentially ATF4, but we didn't know at the time, increases survival through autophagy. And Laurie showed very nicely that this is relevant for human lymphomas because if we analyze genetically the gene expression profile of a number of lymphomas you see here from publicly available databases, she showed a very nice correlation between um, a, a UPR signature. All these are uh, genes that are downstream of PERC, including ATF4 and asparagine synthetase, which is a target of ATF4, they correlate with MYC translocations. So the tumors that have high MYC levels also have an active uh, uh, UPR response. More recently, we partnered with the uh, lab of David Ruggiero, uh, who's an excellent collaborator at UCSF. And we published uh, in Science Translational Medicine that <laughs> another uh, tumor type that is really um, important for uh, integrated stress response activation um, is uh, prostate cancer, because in prostate cancer, you have a dual uh, uh, double hit of uh, MYC over amplification and P10 deletion. So P10 is a very important tumor suppressor. And you can see that when you activate MYC, uh, phosphorylation of PERC was up a little bit. Uh, it also was up a little bit when you delete P10, but the combination of the two, which exists in a lot of uh, uh, mouse models and also human 
prostate cancers dramatically upregulates PERC levels, uh, NEF12. And if you look again in human tumors, the patients that uh, exhibit uh, patent loss in high EF12 phosphorylation levels uh, show the uh, uh, shorter survival or metastasis-free um, uh, survival in Kaplan-Meier uh, survival analysis. Again, showing that activation of this UPR and ISR uh, contribute to tumorigenesis and aggressiveness of the tumors in vivo. So then the question was, um, following Laurie's work was, so what was downstream of EF12? Of course, I mentioned ATF4, but EF12 could be doing a lot of other things. So um, uh, another very talented graduate student at the time, uh, Faven Tamarek, who was a graduate student at Penn in the cancer biology uh, department, uh, took on this, this uh, task. She wanted to see exactly what is the role of ATF4. And is PERC the only kinase upstream? Because I just told you that GCN2 can also do the same thing. And uh, Faven developed a very nice uh, in vitro model of uh, consisting of um, a colorectal cancer cell line in which she transformed with a MIGIR chimera. So MIGIR is a, uh, is a chimera protein that uh, has part of the estrogen receptor. And when it's expressed, it, it expresses the MIG uh, transactivation domain, but it's kept in the cytoplasm in an inactive state because it's bound to uh, Hitchhock proteins. When you add um, uh, agonist to ER, such as 4-hydroxytamoxifen, uh, it causes a conformational change to the ER and releases MIG into the nucleus. As you can see here, these are nuclear levels of MIG. So you see when you add 4 hydroxytamoxifen MIG levels increase. And also we see a concomitant increase in ATF4 levels. And then using this system, she asked, what is the role of PERC and GCN2 in phosphorylating EF12 and ATF4? And uh, what she saw is that if she used a, a, a siRNA for PERC, completely abrogating PERC, uh, you'd decrease the phosphorylation of EF12, but there's still some residual one. If you knock out GCN2, uh, you see here, GCN2 is not expressed anymore. Uh, you also decrease the levels of EF12, but it's only when you combine PERC and GCN2 together that you now completely obliterate EF12 for phosphorylation and ATF4 activation, which is downstream. And also you dramatically increase the, the um, ability, um, the, the inherent ability of the cells to undergo apoptosis as shown here. And she also confirmed this by performing chronogenic survival assays. Uh, if she uh, took uh, cells in which she uh, deleted ATF4 and turned on, um, on MIG, as you see here, uh, th these cells you know, uh, dra show dramatic reduction in their ability to form uh, colonies and, and therefore to proliferate. So then we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the mechanism. ATF4 is a transcription factor, as I told you, it's a leucine zipper factor. MIG is also a transcription factor. So we hypothesized that perhaps they could cooperate together to uh, increase the repertoire of genes that were important in tumor progression. So uh, uh, Faven spent quite some time developing and optimizing a technique called ChIP-seq, where you, um, <clears throat> you induce ATF4 and MIG, and then you precipitate the chromatin, uh, it, you degrade everything other than the uh, 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 regions that are protected by the bi binding of ATF4 or MIG, and you perform uh, gene expression analysis or, or DNA sequencing. And um, we saw that uh, uh, ATF4 and MIG bound to unique sites in the genome, but they also had several common sites, as you see here. And uh, when we analyzed these uh, common sites, we found that they fell into two major categories. Um, uh, for example, tRNA charging, biosynthesis of amino acids, and also protein biosynthesis itself were dramatically upregulated when we had both ATF4 and MIG um, expressed. And these were the results of the chip seq analysis. And when we, asked, uh, when we took this one step further and asked, um, uh, do they have any common genes? And what other transcription factors are ATF4 and MIG partnering with? The only ones that came up were ATF4 itself, because ATF4 can also bind as a dimer. Uh, and the second one that ATF4 was found to partner with was MIG. You see the Z-score here is, it was the only uh, one that was significant. None of the other 100 transcription factors, I'm only showing you here the, the, the top uh, four that showed some level of, of, um, of cooperation, but it never reached any level of significance. This suggested to us that ATF4 and MIG have some special cooperation. We showed later that they actually interact uh, in vitro and in vivo. And uh, as expected, most of their uh, target genes were involved in metabolism, but also in protein synthesis, as I mentioned earlier. So one of these targets that attracted our interest was this um, other uh, translation initiation factor called EIF40BP1. And uh, when ATF4 was induced, 
uh, we saw an upregulation. You see here control and eight for our eight hours after induction of CMIC. We see an upregulation of ATF4 binding to the promoter of ef 4 bp one And you can see this also on the protein level. When we turn on MIC by this uh, addition of 4 hydroxytamoxifen, we see a robust uh, uh, upregulation, not only of the basal levels of 4 bp one but also its phosphorylation. <clears throat> and very interestingly, uh, this is completely abrogated when we knock out ATF4 from the cells. So this protein really intrigued us for another reason. It's actually a negative regulator of translation. So uh, I was telling you earlier that um, MIC ramps up translation and makes the cell ready to proliferate. So what is a negative regulator of translation doing here? Why is ATF4 upregulating this break in protein synthesis? So uh, one of the major pathways that regulates protein synthesis and, and actually cell size is the mTOR, uh, PI3K AKT mTOR pathway. And the mTOR uh, Raptor complex is very important. It has two major downstream uh, targets, 40 EBP, uh, of which uh, I showed you earlier, 40 EBP1 is one of the major uh, uh, proteins, uh, gets phosphorylated, as does S6 kinase. And uh, the phosphorylation of 40 EBP1 actually causes a dissociation from another initiation factor called EI4E. And EI4E is an important uh, uh, translation factor because it binds to the cup uh, structure of a lot of mRNAs, including those that are involved in cell growth and proliferation and drives their activity. So when 40 bp is bound to A4E, EI4E cannot bind, it's sequestered away and cannot bind to the cup, so translation is reduced. That's why we say that 40 bp is a, is a break of translation. And uh, its phosphorylation actually by uh, the Raptor mTOR complex releases it uh, uh, to uh, uh, enable activation of specific translation. So we found that ATF4 uh, not only upregulates EF40, but also uh, EF40BP, but also upregulates its phosphorylation, thereby blocking translation. So before we go and, and show you, uh, before I go and show you the data, I wanted to see okay, is this effect functional? What is the role of ATF4 in? actual uh, lymphoma genesis, and what is the, for, the role of ei 4 ebp So to do that, we uh, generated a, um, a, a floxed uh, ATF4 mouse. So uh, for those who are not familiar with this, we, you flank the sites of, of a gene of interest with uh, a very specific small, small repeats of the LOX P site. And now um, you, when uh, this gene is encountered by the uh, query recombinase, the creative companies can actually excise this gene. So you make a conditional knockout mouse. And that's what we did. Uh, we um, uh, went back and got the immune mouse that I told you at the beginning, spontaneously develops lymphomas. And we crossed it, first of all, with a, um, a, a ubiquitous uh, promoter that expresses the creative combinase in an ERT2 uh, fusion chimera protein. So these mice here um, are able to express the creative combinase uh, but only when you're tamoxifen. And then we cross them with our ATF4 flux mice. So we generated essentially mice that will develop lymphomas, but when you give them 4-hydroxytamoxifen, you can actually excise ATF4. So this is a genetic uh, analog of a, uh, because at the time we didn't have an inhibitor for ATF4. It's a genetic experiment that allows you to investigate in vivo what happens when you excise a protein of interest, or if you treat with vehicle, what happens to lymphoma development. And uh, as Feven showed very nicely, what happens is that now you dramatically reduce tumor burden that we showed in this paper that was published a couple of years ago. Um, and also you extend dramatically the life uh, of these mice. These are very aggressive tumors in lymphoma. Um, the, uh, most of the mice die by 42 days, but we can actually more than double the, the uh, average uh, uh, survival of these mice if we uh, deliver um, uh, tamoxifen to activate and excise ATF4. And we know this is not a tamoxifen effect because if we give it to mice that don't have flux the TF4 and TF4 is there, there's no significant difference. And we also showed <coughs> that if we uh, take mice that are treated with vehicle, uh, as you see here, or the uh, tamoxifen, we do uh, get on target deletion of ATF4 and also the 40 BP1 that is the target of ATF4. Is this relevant to human disease? Most of the data that I showed you is actually with mice. And we show that indeed it is because if we take normal human uh, B cells from uh, um, uh, volunteers and compare it to lymphoma cell lines, we see that every single component of this pathway, ATF4 itself, PERC, uh, EF2 alpha, but also for EBP1, are dramatically upregulated in the transform, but not the normal cells. 
We also show the same thing in breast cancer cells and also in colorectal cells. <clears throat> and we also showed that if we go in, again, in uh, patient databases, we see a very nice correlation between a, 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 an ATF4 signature and <clears throat> EIF4 EVP uh, expression levels, both in lymphomas and also in colorectal cancer. Uh, now, we cannot show this correlation with ATF4 itself because <clears throat> if you remember at the beginning, I told you that ATF4 is primarily regulated at the translation level and not at the mRNA level. So we use this signature as a, as a uh, surrogate marker for ATF4. And also we uh, further show that if you have high EF4 EVP expression, you actually do worse uh, in terms of survival um, uh, if you have a B-cell lymphoma. So to summarize this part of my talk and what, what, what this data means so far, um, we know that uh, when MIG is turned on by uh, dysregulation due to amplification or translocation uh, in the genome, uh, uh, three things happen. The first thing is that you have activation of mTOR, that phosphorylates 4 ebp one that releases from EF4E, and EF4E can actually increase specific translation uh, and protein synthesis to drive proliferation and tumor growth. Uh, the other thing that MIG does uh, is that it actually increases uh, tRNA synthesis um, and data that I haven't shown you, this causes an imbalance and activa activation of GCN2 that also was for let's see, F12. The third thing, third thing that MIG does is that it partners with ATF4 for the upregulation of a number of metabolic genes or genes involved in metabolism, such as amino acid transporters and synthetases. But it also paradoxically upregulates for EBP1, which moderates translation. It doesn't block it, but it moderates. So it's like a speeding car going down the highway uh, if we want to think of, of uh, transformation and tumor growth in that way, but you also need a bigger break to be able to adapt the, uh, the metabolism to the uh, um, uh, metabolic state of the cell at the time. If you are deprived of amino acids, you want to block translation because it's a very energy expensive uh, process. However, if you don't have ATF4, you uh, cannot make amino acid transporters or synthetases and you do not synthesize new proteins, you also don't have the break, and you now release MIG to uh, actually increase protein synthesis. This puts an extra ER load in the in the um, uh, in the in the uh, lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum and causes cell death because there's no counterbalance here to moderate translation in the eventual absence of amino acid groups. So that was the model we we proposed, and additional studies we've done now are, are further testing this model. So we believe based on this that actually ATF4 acts as a rheostat of the cell. When conditions allow, it, uh, it partners with ATF4 to actually drive uh, um, a proliferation and keep protein synthesis levels in a moderate level. Um, and if it's not there, actually, um, you know, you have overactivation of these processes and induction of cell death and um, uh, decrease tumor genesis. So the last uh, three or four years, we actually turn our attention to what happens, um, uh, what role, potential role does the integrated stress response play uh, in the host rather than in the tumor cells themselves? Because we know that host processes such as angiogenesis, the immune uh, response against tumors, and also the stroma of the tumor are very important for tumor growth. And because we had the ATF for flux mice, we had the perfect tool to study this. So instead of crossing them to the inumic model, we uh, cross them again to the ROSA26, which is a ubiquitous promoter expressing the Cree recombinase in, a, in an ER chimera. And now we have all these different, um, the three different um, genotypes of ATF4 that allow us with the addition of tamoxifen uh, to these mice, we actually give it intraperitoneally for, for five days uh, to generate either wild type heterozygotes or complete knockout ATF4 mice. So the work I'm gonna describe now is in uh, revision um, and uh, it, it has been done by uh, a very talented senior uh, research investigator in my lab, Yanis Verginadis, who has spent the last three years working on this uh, interesting uh, aspect. So um, Yanis took these flocks mice and, as I mentioned, deliver uh, tamoxifen for five consecutive days, uh, which uh, eliminates ATF4 and then implants them with different tumor models and asks the question, what is the impact on that? So Yanis showed very nicely that after five days, we can actually almost completely excise ATF4. Now, this was in the lung, but he has shown the same result uh, in, um, in uh, liver, uh, skin, and other tissues. ATF4 is almost completely ablated when we deliver tamoxifen for five days. 
And the impact of this on the mice is not dramatic. They lose a little bit of weight, but that stabilizes. And uh, we actually have updated data for a year, a year and a half. These mice show no significant problems. They also show some anemia at the beginning that completely resolves. But these mice uh, are, are fine if you, if you de delete ATF4 in the adult stage. We do this around um, week seven or eight of these mice. However, when you implant them with uh, a, a very aggressive tumor, in this case, uh, a very aggressive melanoma tumor, you see that the mice that you implant with the wild type tumors, the tumors grow much faster. Uh, those that lack ATF4 grow significantly um, slower and the heads grow uh, somewhere in between. And these results, again, in a significant improvement in overall survival of these mice implanted with these very aggressive melanoma tumors. And also we showed this in a very aggressive pancreatic tumor model. These are all genetic models to the C57 black six mice. If you in, uh, uh, implant them um, in the flank, and recently he also showed this in an orthotopic manner in the, in the uh, pancreas, uh, you get a dramatic tumor growth play. So the only thing different here is the, actual, is the mouse itself. Um, so um, how about metastasis? We all know that um, most patients do not die because of their primary tumor, but they die because of metastatic uh, disease. And we have developed over the, over the years a very nice uh, model where we call it a tumor growth resection model. So in this case, um, we've done it with melanoma and also with pancreatic cancer. You implant the tumor in the mice, um, either uh, in wild type or ATF4 knockout mice. You let the tumor grow to about three to 500 cubic millimeters, uh, excuse me, 300 to 500 cubic millimeters, and then you surgically excise them. And you suture back the mice and you wait until metastasis develop, usually in the lung. Uh, I apologize for the noise, but that's, that's the helicopter of the hospital because that's where I work. I hope you can still hear me. Um, and uh, when we open the mice after four weeks, when they start, start showing signs of, uh, of morbidity, we were really blown away by this data. We've never seen this in any tumor model. Most of the lungs of these mice uh, were actually clear of tumors. There were very few nodules actually in some of the mice. And interestingly, it also showed this phenotype in the, in the heterozygote uh, site. A very, very strong phenotype when you don't have ATF4 in these mice. So what's going on? As I mentioned, we're not looking at the tumor intrinsic effect, but something in the host now is impacting tumor growth. And we know that tumors are very heterogeneous entities. In addition to um, uh, the tumor cells, you have the immune system, you have T cells, uh, tumor associated macrophages, um, and also you have uh, uh, extracellular matrix and cancer associated fibroblasts in, this, uh, in these tumors that recently have gained a lot of attention because they've been shown to support a tumor growth by providing nutrients, for example, um, uh, to tumors by affecting angiogenesis and so on. And of course, the tumor vasculature is also provided by the host. So I don't have time to show you the data, but at least in the melanoma and the pancreatic model we uh, follow, um, we eliminated any significant role of the immune system in, this, uh, in, in these types of tumors. We don't exclude it in potentially other tumors, but we didn't see any major effect, uh, for example, by inhibiting um, CD8 uh, in T cells. So we turn our attention to the vasculature uh, and also to the stroma. And uh, right away, we, we noticed a very interesting phenotype when we analyzed two more of the same size. So it's important to emphasize that when we do these experiments, we actually analyze tumors that are about the same size. So we wait in the knockout mice until the tumors reach about 500 cubic millimeters. So we always like to analyze tumors of the same size because otherwise you're, you're, you're not comparing uh, apples to apples. When we did that, we found a very dramatic <clears throat> deficiency in uh, both microvascular density and also in microvessel length. You see that the tumors grown in the knockout mice are, have, have blood vessels, but they're fewer, and also they seem to be stunted, they're significantly smaller, and they appear to lack any significant lumen compared to those grown in the ATF4 wild type uh, mice. And if we look uh, functionally to this, in these vessels by injecting, for example, a fluorescent dextran, <clears throat> this is uh, a high molecular uh, weight chemical that goes into the mice. It, it, it's compatible with, with, with uh, biological survival of the mice. And it goes into these blood vessels and diffuses, perfuses away. And you can see we get very nice perfusion in the tumors grown in the wild type mice, but it appears to get stuck and occluded. There's no perfusion at all in, this, in these vessels. They appear to be collapsing um, and we don't get any perfusion, this would imply that you don't get oxygen or nutrients in this tumor. And you see this quantitation over here. This lack of perfusion actually results in these very large areas of necrosis 
if we stain the tumors with hoist, with, which actually can show you where live cells are, are uh, they not haven't fragmented the chromatin, uh, you see that they're very um, large areas uh, as opposed to those grown in wild type mites that are much smaller areas. And we actually quantified these with uptake of uh, propidium iodide and showing the necrotic areas dramatically upregulated in the, in the tumors grown in the ATF or knockout mice. So one other aspect of, of the stroma is actually, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the cancer associated fibroblasts. And one class of, uh, of, of these fibroblasts um, that is well known to um, contribute to tumor growth is what, what are called uh, vascular fibroblasts or neural cells. Uh, they um, are similar but not identical uh, um, to um, other blood vessels, uh, but, but they're mesenchymal in origin. <clears throat> they're not pericytes, but they express, uh, one of the markers that they express a lot is smooth muscle actin, and you can actually detect them that way. And uh, we were really uh, very surprised to see almost complete absence of smooth muscle actin, even in the existing, around the existing blood vessels. And we think this is an important um, component that results in this deficiency. This is the quantitation here from multiple uh, mice. And in the pancreatic tumors, the data I showed you before was in the melanoma. In the pancreatic tumors, there's another marker of, of acti activated fibroblasts uh, uh, called uh, fibroblast ac uh, um, activation protein or FAP. And this was also dramatically reduced in the uh, tumors grown in the ATF or knockout mice. So to gain uh, more uh, insight into what exactly is going on, how does ATF4 deficiency lead to this deficiency in cancer associated fibroblasts? We went back, back into our mice, we knocked out ATF4, and we did microarray analysis from uh, wild type and knockout uh, ATF4 uh, uh, mice from the, from the lungs of these mice. And that, our gene expression analysis is shown in this volcano plot showed, of course, as we expected, ATF4 is, is um, underrepresented. Anything to the left of this median is underrepresented, as you would expect. And we did find some uh, proangiogenic cytokines that were uh, upregulated, and I'll come back to this later. But what really attracted our attention was all these collagen genes. Uh, for example, COL1A1, which is the major uh, collagen um, produced in mammalian cells, was dramatically downregulated, it's mRNA as well as COL1A2 and COL3A1. Uh, but what I showed you was actually done in, um, in uh, normal lungs. We decided to go to the actual source and look at the tumors themselves. So we did what, is, what we call single cell RNA analysis, where you take the tumors, um, and we did it both in smaller and larger tumors, and you disperse all the cells. And then you do um, a, a full RNA sequence analysis on uh, three to 5,000 individual cells. And based on the genetic profiles that you see here, on their expression profiles, you can actually group them into the, the different uh, classes. The, the cells you see here, all these groups here, are different melanoma cells that show different uh, gene expression phenotype. Um, the magenta that you see here are T cells and NK cells, the brown and the macrophages, and so on. And this group here that I have uh, uh, highlighted are the cancer-associated fibroblasts. So when we looked in this cluster specifically, we saw a downregulation of COL1A1, as you see here, the uh, results from multiple experiments. And again, what really um, uh, was dramatic, but also agreed with the immunohistochemistry data, was a complete absence of um, smooth muscle actin. ACTA2 is the gene that codes for uh, SMA. It was completely absent from the knockout um, uh, tumors. And also another marker of uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts, PDGFR beta, was dramatically reduced in the cells. So when we looked more carefully within this group, we identified this subset as we call uh, vascular cuffs that other groups have identified as being closely associated with the vasculature. And this specific group of V-cuffs actually are the ones that express most of the uh, ACTA2 and PTGFR beta. And when we look at the overall uh, ratio of these cells in the wild type and knockout tumors, you see that um, the V-cuffs are dramatically uh, reduced, both in smaller and larger tumors. They just disappear from, from, the, uh, from the tumors. And we feel that plays an important role in angiogenesis and tumor growth. So what do these cuffs really do? Well, they're actually professional uh, collagen secretory cells. They, they secrete a lot of collagen. And this uh, allows for the formation of the extracellular matrix and the attachment of both the cuffs and also the uh, the blood vessels, endothelial cells. And um, Yanis did a, a, an interesting in vitro assay where you plate the cells, we wait eight days, um, and then these, these cells lay down collagen, 
that you can actually identify them with uh, two photon microscopy in a process called uh, single harmonic generation. Collagen can actually autofluoresce when you uh, shine a light of a specific wavelength. And uh, I don't need to explain this to you that in the knockout um, uh, fibroblasts, although you see a substantial number of viable fibroblasts, there's very little to no collagen deposited. You see the quantitation here. All right, so the lack of ATF4 uh, um, makes these calves not be able to produce collagen and in the tumor, it actually reduces their numbers. So what does ATF4 have to do with collagen? So let's revisit um, from basic biochemistry, the, the, the collagen biochemistry here. Uh, collagen essentially is made of only two amino acids, proline and lysine, uh, and, and, and um, excuse me, proline and glycine, proline and glycine, and uh, prolines can also be hydroxylated. So essentially you have three amino acids and it's repeats of these three amino acids that make these uh, polypeptide chains. It's actually synthesized in the plasma reticulum. It's extensively hydroxylated and glycosylated in the endoplasmic reticulum. It makes, it's made into these fibrils that, that are then uh, exported from the nucleus and the cell membrane. And then they get proteolytically cleaved, uh, processed, and also uh, cross-linked here by proline hydroxylases to give it stiffness. So this is basically, um, uh, in summary, uh, how collagen is made. And um, you know, th the question was, uh, where is the deficiency that we see in the ATF4 knockout cells? Is it uh, in the mRNA, as we already had some idea from our uh, RNA-seq data, but is it also a, a deficiency in the synthesis of, of, uh, of, the, of the building blocks of, of collagen or also in the secretion? Uh, and we confirmed again that the protein levels of collagen are dramatically reduced in our knockout cells. And when we, we reintroduce uh, ATF4 from an adenoviral vector, we can actually recover a substantial amount of this collagen uh, that is produced in this fibroblast. And Yanis also identified, interestingly, a, a bona fide ATF4 binding site in the col one a one gene that is actually within intron 5. So with these results and, this, and the RNA-seq data, we did identify deficiency at this stage of the synthesis of mRNA of, of collagen. However, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, collagen is made primarily of two uh, amino acids, and we turned into, um, uh, for help, to Dr. Jean Bingier, who is an assistant professor at Stanford, and another tip, uh, Jean Bing was uh, another graduate student of mine uh, that did um, uh, very nice work working on GCN2 and ATF4, then went to Craig Thompson's group at Memorial Sloan Kettering and, and work on mass spectrometry and, and metabolic labeling. And, and now at Stanford, he's actually um, a, a very good collaborator. So the tip is, you know, not only train great people, but also keep uh, good relationships with them because in the future, they may also be your collaborators. And indeed, Jambing did this uh, uh, isotope metabolic labeling. He looked at incorporation of label into the M1 and M2 positions of both proline and glycine that you see here. And he's, he saw that in the ATF4 knockout cells, both at one and three hours, there is a reduction in incorporation of the labeling and a concomitant increase in the M0 position, showing that there is actual block in the uh, biosynthesis of these two amino acids. And data I don't have time to show you uh, uh, have supported in the literature that ATF4 regulates the rate limiting steps enzymes that uh, lead to the biosynthesis of both proline and glycine. So we have uh, a multiple deficiency in the uh, synthesis of proline, both in the mRNA and the building blocks, the, the amino acids themselves. So if fibroblasts are important for the uh, phenotype we see in the tumors, we should be able to reverse this effect by supplementing these tumors with wild type fibroblasts. And indeed, that's what we see. If you focus here on this tumor growth curve, uh, the dotted lines show that the growth curves of um, uh, ATF4 wild type or ATF4 knockout, uh, uh, tumors grown in, in wild type or knockout, or knockout uh, mice, if we supplement them with knockout fibroblasts. However, if we supplement them with wild type fibroblasts, we, do the, we mix them prior to injecting them in the flank, we can actually move both curves uh, uh, to the left and dramatically increase the rate of growth, but primarily in the uh, ATF4 deficient uh, mice. So if you supplement this uh, fibroblast, the wild type fibroblast to the knockout tumors, you actually uh, can dramatically upregulate their tumor growth rate. And finally, um, all the data I've shown you so far, ATF4 is uh, uh, deleted in the whole mouse. And to be a little bit more sure about the contribution of the fibroblast to this process, we actually generated another knockout mouse, but in this, in this case, instead of ex expressing Cree 
in the whole mouse, we used a collagen specific promoter that specifically restricts expression of the CRE recombinase in the fibroblast compartment. So now we have deletion of ATF4 only in the fibroblast. And again, when we grow melanoma or pancreatic tumors that I'm not showing you here, we have this significant deficiency, further solidifying the finding that the fibroblasts are playing an important role. So in the last piece of the puzzle is, okay, when we, when the uh, mice don't have ATF4 or ATF4 is deleted, we have this deficiency in um, angiogenesis uh, because the fibroblasts uh, don't make collagen. But what do collagen and fibroblasts have to do with angiogenesis per se? Well, it turns out that uh, fibroblasts, especially in tumors, are the primary uh, cells producing proangiogenic cytokines. The tumor produces some, uh, the endothelial cells themselves can produce some, but by and large, the the, the biggest amount, the largest amount of proangiogenic cytokines comes from, cyto from fibroblasts. So we decided to do what is called an in vitro angiogenesis assay. This is a, a sprouting um, and tube formation assay, as it's called, where you plate endothelial cells. And you see when we supply them, these cells with uh, conditioned media from wild type mice, now these uh, cells proliferate, they actually connect with each other, they make sprouts. And what you see here are the first uh, indications of formation of tubes, the tubes that will make the blood vessel. We can actually score this, and there's software that analyzes uh, the number of these connections and the sprouting and so on. However, if we, if we supplement uh, these cells with conditioned media from knockout fibroblasts, uh, we see a dramatic reduction in the level of, of, this, um, of this tube formation, suggesting that the fibroblasts from the knockout mice cannot support angiogenesis. And as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, angiogenic cytokines are produced by fibroblasts. So to look at that, we perform what is called the reverse phase antibody arrays, where we, uh, you have um, immobilized here on these arrays a number of proangiogenic cytokines, up to, up to 30 angi angiogenic cytokines. And then you expose it to an extract from either um, uh, knockout or, uh, or wild-type um, uh, fibroblasts. And as you can see, uh, the expression of some of these cytokines such as uh, STF1 is reduced when you knock out ATF4, okay? Also VGF, which is a major proangiogenic cytokine, and so does IGFPP9. But when you, you reintroduce ATF4 through an adenovirus, you can actually recover these levels. And this is shown very nicely here with this uh, quantitation that we did. Um, you see the reduction in the knockout and the re-expression of these angiogenic cytokines uh, when you reintroduce ATF4. Finally, is this relevant to human disease? We always like to go back to humans uh, to uh, uh, solidify the, the importance of our work. And we think that it is because again, when we look at the, at the surrogate gene expression signature of ATF40 fibroblasts, we see a very nice correlation of this uh, ATF4 target gene signature um, um, with uh, collagen 1A1, collagen uh, 1A1 in, in uh, melanoma. This is in a pancreatic adenocarcinoma and also for, with smooth muscle acne, showing again that a, a, whenever you have high ATF4, you have high levels of both collagen uh, and smooth muscle actin. And we also show this in the protein level using what is called a tissue microarray. Each of these circles here represent a different tumor from a patient. Um, we uh, stained uh, uh, histopathologically for expression of both collagen and ATF4. And al although you see a wide uh, variation, whenever we see low ATF4 levels shown here, we have low levels of collagen, but when we have high levels of ATF4, we have high levels of collagen and the correlation coefficient here is very high. So uh, to, to uh, finalize, uh, here's a, a, a model of what we think is going on in these cells. Uh, when we have uh, wild type ATF4, we have, uh, we have a, a significant support of uh, tumor growth because ATF4, first of all, upregulates the COL1 and COL2 uh, mRNAs that will make collagen, but also ATF4 regulates the biosynthesis of the building blocks, which is glycine and proline. You have a significant amount of collagen that is not secreted. The collagen fibers and the attachment of the uh, um, uh, cuffs to these uh, collagen fibers stimulate the release of a significant amount of proangiogenic cytokines, and you have strong angiogenesis that supports tumor growth. And if you don't have ATF4, you have much less RNA of the uh, collagen genes. You don't have the building blocks. You don't uh, produce collagen fibers. These cells actually undergo, um, uh, they stop proliferating as we've shown, I didn't show you that data. And you have very little 
uh, angiogenesis and, uh, and tumor growth. So in summary, um, to conclude from both parts of my talk, uh, I believe, I, I, I hope I have convinced you that if we ablate uh, the tumor intrinsic ATF4, we have attenuated primary and metastatic growth. Uh, but also if we delete the host ATF4, we have uh, the, the same um, uh, biological impact. Uh, acute deletion of, of the host ATF4 uh, results in, as I mentioned, transient anemia and mild weight loss, but these recover within the first month. And we don't have any other overt toxicities in these mice based on uh, an extensive necropsy analysis we've done to uh, after a year or a year and a half we have done these mice. We believe that fibroblast activation, uh, especially in the vascular cups, is defective in the absence of ATF4. And that ATF4 is required for uh, collagen synthesis, calf activation, and angiogenesis. And altogether, um, these results, because if you have an inhibitor, it will inhibit ATF4 not only in the tumor, but also in the uh, surrounding um, uh, tissue, including uh, uh, the calves. We believe that there is a very uh, uh, nice therapeutic window that exists for inhibiting ATF4 as an anti tumor strategy. Um, ATF4 is a transcription factor. It's not as easy as, as PERC or GCN2 to inhibit, but we feel based on a lot of data we've, we've published that perhaps PERC inhibition will be sufficient, but we think there may be um, redundancy in this pathway because of this, both these kinases can actually phosphorylate the F2-alpha. So we're performing small molecule library screens. And actually uh, that's why I, I started this uh, um, a startup company here to start screening uh, using the ATF4 uh, luciferase vector as a, as, a, um, as a screening tool to identify uh, inhibitors that will specifically uh, block the expression of ATF4. And finally, my last tip for the day, uh, surround yourself with really, really competent, uh, enthusiastic, energetic, and, and nice people to uh, help your research program, and you will learn a lot from them as well. Uh, I already mentioned Yanis Verginatis that did the bulk of the work with the uh, uh, tumor, uh, tumor cell extrinsic uh, role of ATF4 Nectaria is working actually uh, partly uh, uh, through Velti on, uh, uh, on the screens. Uh, other people that I have contributed to the talk that I mentioned today and, and former lab members uh, have strong collaborators. I mentioned David's lab, but also other individuals here at Penn uh, in Europe and, and at Stanford that uh, helped make uh, this work uh, possible. And of course, the funding that made this possible. Uh, and uh, again, we are looking for always for uh, really motivated uh, postdoc and senior scientist uh, positions in my lab. So uh, I'm sorry I went a little bit over. Uh, I'm going to stop here and take any questions you may have. Thank you, dear Dr. Kumenis, for the excellent uh, presentation of your research. It was really interesting. So um, at this point, as uh, Dr. Kumenis mentioned, we are taking any questions anybody has. So. Maybe I can. can. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can stop sharing. Let's see. Okay. I want to see someone. Mm -hmm. So uh, until somebody asks a question, I think I'll, I'll take the advantage. And so it was really interesting the fact that uh, ATA4 um, regulates collagen. Uh, biosynthesis and metabolism, if I may say, but you don't see any long-term side effects when in, in the mouse models. How is that possible? Because you, you're dealing with a holistic, I guess, model yeah. uh, in that respect. That's a very good question, Maria. I, I've been asked that a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, so a couple of interesting things about collagen and, and uh, we also, Actually, the, the, the company got a, a, its first NIH award to study fibrosis after radiation, which is also um, involves collagen. Um, we think that there's something special about the way ATF4, uh, the, the timing of, of regulating the collagen, but also the long half-life of collagen. So collagen, once it's produced, it's stable for many, many, many days. Okay, And it's very difficult to actually uh, lose collagen uh, very quickly. Now, if you stop it in the tumors, it may have a tumors completely uh, continually undergo reorganization in their structure. Uh, and they're also dramatically infiltrated by uh, T cells, macrophages that may actually break down collagen. 
So we think that that case, um, in the case of the tumor, either the, the way that collagen is deposited or other um, features of the tumor help get rid of collagen faster. We've looked at these mice um, over, uh, as, as I mentioned, a year, year and a half. We look specifically at areas that, that rely on collagen, um, uh, you know, su such as junctions and, you know, uh, um, you know, in, in the knees and, and uh, uh, in the extremities of the mouse, and we don't see any breakdown. Um, and also, it does not appear to be involved in wound healing because, uh, as I mentioned to you, in one of the experiments, we take the tumor out and suture the mice back. And the, the, the mice do fine, the, the, the wound, it's a big wound when you take out the tumor, um, they completely heal. So um, is that gonna translate to humans? We don't know, we hope it does. Um, the other aspect of it is also we don't inhibit, although we do eliminate ATF4 from the whole mouse, as you said, holistically, globally, um, what we've noticed is that highly proliferating cells, such as the, the bone marrow, because I told you they get a little bit anemic, turns out that ATF4 is important for maturation of some erythrocytes. Um, by two or three weeks, we see recovery of the bone marrow. When we analyze it, ATF4 is back. So although you excise it, the, the way you do the, um, the tamoxifen-induced excision is not 100%, right? So it's, late, let's say, 90 95%. The rest, if you have a highly proliferating uh, compartment, it will recover the ATF4. So in that respect, it's not um, permanent. So there may be uh, ways to replenish maybe osteoblasts or osteoblasts that do produce collagen in, in, during development. Uh, but that still doesn't mean that ATF4 is not a good target because that's basically what you would get if you have an inhibitor. You have to give the inhibitor multiple times, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's how we think about the whole role of ATF4 in normal biology. Thank you. Interesting. And, um... Maybe I'm, I'm not quite, quite familiar with the collagen, but is it, there are different types of collagen uh, yes. and are they all uh, right. affected? Right. Uh, there are different, there's 12, yeah. I, I believe 12 or 14 collagen, collagen genes, major collagen genes in humans. Um, by and far the most abundant one is called 1A1, uh, but there's different combinations of that collagen. And it's also, um, the, it, it basically the building blocks are the same, but it's the repeats how extensively it's hydroxylated, and also it differs in the um, C and N terminal actually and how it's processed. So it is possible. That's another reason. Thanks for uh, bringing it up. It is possible that um, some of those uh, areas that we would be worried about collagen breakdown, um, they're not um, affected because they're not in the, in those genes. We see maybe four of, or five of the collagen genes are significantly reg, uh, downregulated, but maybe other, other collagen genes uh, are not as much uh, downregulated. Although uh, also we see a, a decrease in proline and, and, uh, and glycine. Uh, but again, I stand on the fact that um, uh, existing collagen in, in, in most areas that you, you would need it uh, doesn't need to be synthesized at all, right? And the collagen there is, uh, can persist for quite, quite, quite some time. I assume it's well guarded because it's so necessary. Yeah, and it doesn't, as, as I understand, it doesn't turn over unless you have, um, you know, pathological conditions uh, such as inflammation, for example, chronic arthritis, for example, um, or injury. So it doesn't turn over as quickly. So maybe that's why we don't see these major effects on on the um, on a normal ATF form of that mouse. So I don't see any questions still. Um, ah, okay. Dr. Yanis Sarianis has one. Um, and uh, he asks, do you notice any differences in the coiling of the helices? Right. That's a great question from a protein chemist. Yanni, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we have not looked at that. It's possible. It's also po very possible that the glycosylation of collagen is affected um, and, and the hydroxylation itself. We haven't looked carefully because to be honest, there's very little collagen there in the knockout. So, um, but we are uh, we are discussing it with the other Yanis here uh, to look at the heterozygote mouse because that makes about half the collagen. And we wanna see if, if the, um, because if you don't have proper glycosylation or hydroxylation, you're not gonna get those helices in the right, in the right size. But 
yeah, maybe maybe we can send you some of the some of the collagen for analysis there because you, you do have a great equipment there to do that for us. Thanks. Okay. So um, so I have another, I guess, um, do they have any other phenotype in terms of the collagen? Because you just mentioned that they don't have at all, or like very reduced levels of collagen. I'm very interested how they look. <laughs> um, no, the mice, the mice look totally fine. As I mentioned, okay. as I mentioned, they, they do have this anemia. We're preparing another paper to show that. Thankfully, it's not in the primordium stem cell, but it's in a progenitor compartment. So the stem cells are fine, but going from the uh, actual stem cell to the uh, stage two of maturation of the uh, erythrocyte, you, you require it here for, for reasons. I don't even want to go, you know, it will take me another 10 minutes. It has to do with ROS. Um, but okay. as I mentioned, within two weeks, the hematocrit comes back to normal. So, and we think that's because you're not completely, totally ablating it. Um, there is an embryonic knockout of ATF4, and that has a much more severe phenotype. 50% yeah. of the mice die in utero. The other 50, because of anemia, the other 50 have a, a, another way to bypass and, um, uh, and make some hemoglobin uh, and er er erythrocytes. Um, but in our hands, it lasts only two or three weeks. The other phenotype that I briefly mentioned and touched upon, they lose weight. And interestingly, the weight they lose is actually in the visceral fat. They mm -hmm. have less brown fat. And we're collaborating with uh, two groups in Canada that we send our mice to look at that because that would be another very, very interesting and potentially yeah. uh, tractable uh, finding that we have. Yeah, so I guess it also links to metabolism if they- Exactly. Uh, exactly. ROS and brown fat, right? Right, and it's more, it's more metabol metabolic regulation. Yeah. I see. The, the ROS plays a more important role in the, um, in the stem cell, uh, the stemness uh, of, of these cells. But the, the, the blood vessels are also affected, if I remember correctly, right. in the tumor, at least, maybe. Right. Uh, we don't think that's uh, because we looked at pericytes and endothelial cells, mm -hmm. and their numbers are not affected. It's just that they don't grow, they don't form these tubes. Um, we cannot exclude completely an effect, but the fact that when we, you remember the experiment where we supplement, we add additional wild type fibroblasts in the knockout mice, we actually almost recovered the full, the full growth. So if there was a significant defect in the um, endothelium, uh, we wouldn't be able to see that. I mean, there could be a smaller effect, but we think the primary effect is in these fibroblasts that are, are absolutely needed to form this sprouting and these, these vessels. It's amazing how specific it is to the tumor. I mean, that's, that's my yeah. take home from this. Uh, yeah, so yeah. that's why we, we really like it here for, and we, we wanna be able to target it. And we're looking at all kinds of um, approaches to do that. Excellent. So um, I don't see we have any other questions. Um, Thank you. I, Thanks yeah. everybody. Thank yeah. you for joining us and again, uh, giving us this honor of having you today. Uh, no, the, the honor was all mine. Thank you very much <laughs> and continue all the good work. Thank uh, you. Yeah. And Bye, everybody. I wish you a good rest of your day. You too. Thank you, everybody. Kalinita, yes, us. Yes, us.